welcome to Shop Talk. I'm Jennifer Lynch. And I'm Jim Silver. And this week we have Anton Robby, co-CEO and co-founder of Spinmaster. Welcome, Anton. Welcome. Thanks. So we know a lot about Spinmaster, and there's been a lot out there about how you originally started. But one thing, even though I know you for 20 years, how did it actually start? I mean, did you go to Ben? Did you go to Renan? Right. And also, where did the name come from, Spinmaster? Right. For us, it was about the who, not the what, right? Both of us, uh, you know, we come from entrepreneurial families. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being an entrepreneur was always talked around the dinner table from when we were born for all of us. And Spin Master, people say it started in 94, but it didn't. It started way before. And it was about, we had this university, Renan and I had this university poster business called Campus Faces. And when I, when I say Spin Master was about the who, not the what, what I mean is, is, is that we came together because we shared this passion, right? Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to build something. We loved taking risks. We loved, you know, business and the entrepreneur thing. And we decided to go into business without even knowing what we were going to do. And what happened was we had a university business for four years in the summer. And that's when we got to know each other. And that's when we knew we had the exact same values. Mm. That's when we knew we had the passion to build. And we didn't even know we wanted to be a toy company in mm. the beginning. Actually, the first product came to us from Israel. It was called Earth Buddy. I remember right, Earth Buddies yes. with the hair. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So we were just, we were like piss and vinegar. And <laughs> when we found the Earth Buddy, when Earth Buddy came to us, we were like, let's launch it. And again, for the first two years of the company, there was no strategy, no PowerPoint. No private equity investing us. We were gotcha. just... Was it just you, Renan, or was Ben also part of the launch? Well, Benny I met in university. Okay. And Benny came in, uh, he came in in 94. Mm -hmm. So Renan and I did the university posters together. Mm -hmm. Benny came in right away because I said to Benny, can you come out and help run the factory? I mean, think about the polarity here. because he's, <laughs> he's the chief creative officer. <laughs> and he came in starting to run the factory. And... Um, and Benny's like, yeah, I'll come, I'll help out for a couple of months. When I went to Hong Kong a couple of years later, the ho my hotel room was our showroom. And I used to try to make sure that, that the bed got taken out before the customers came in, right? Because it was a, basically yeah. a trolley thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, in Hong Kong, my first Hong Kong, I was like the lobby lizard where I was going around between Royal Gardens and Shangri-La, walking around 20 times trying to shake hands with people. I remember I used to, like every buyer, I, I would study their name, their phone number, John Young from Walgreens, Frank Craven from Walmart, the buyers from Toys R Us, KB Toys, and I would just try to shake hands. I'd be going around the lobby, and then I'd know every single, every single uh, hotel on Modi Road I'd know the phone number off by heart to trying to get, wow. and I'd just call and hang up, call and hang up. Wow. Like Shangri-La, 5251-52111. You name any hotel, I'd tell you the phone number off by heart. Jeez. And we just started from such humble beginnings. I mean, Benny and I used to sleep in the same... <laughs> <laughs> ben? <You know? laughs> right, so it's just like every part of the company started from very humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. We used to handle every side, you know, uh, matching purchase orders, putting out fires, mm -hmm. and um, it's, uh, you know, it, it was very entrepreneurial. Yeah. So, so much of it from mm. the beginnings for you guys sounded like it was a lot of baptism by fire moments. Right. So um, what would you say were your biggest challenges um, in the, during the beginning yeah. stages? In the first couple of years, I mean, we faced... I mean, there's two groups of challenges. There's mm -hmm. challenges that came from growth, mm -hmm. and then there's just other type of challenges, right? Like the challenges from growth were good challenges. It was just putting out fires, like reallocating product, having to figure out how to air freight. I mean, when we, when we started in the first year, we were manufacturing the Earth Buddies locally in, yeah. in Toronto. We had a factory. So we, would, we were having challenges where we would run out of sawdust or grass seed or nylons or the eyes for them. And, we'd, and Benny would call and he's like, I've got 40 people standing here and the, and the line shut down. So we were constantly putting out fires. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, you got to remember, we are 20 years old. You know, one of our biggest challenges was attracting the right type of talent. Right. Like you can't imagine um, at that stage, you know, trying to convince people to join the company. Mm -hmm. 
you know, we couldn't, we couldn't convince any Americans, okay, to come up to Canada, you know, and it's not just our tax. <laughs> <laughs> or the weather. Right, and yeah. <laughs> so it was, um, it was really hard on the talent side. And we would go through, you know, make mistakes mm -hmm. and trying to attract the talent that we wanted. And there was, the, the thing in Toronto is that there was no toy companies in driving distance that developed. Mm -hmm. They were just, like in Canada, 25 years ago, it was just distributors. Gotcha. So no one had done design and development and engineering and the real, you know, uh, early stage stuff. And then, like I said, I mean, there's endless stories about uh, things that came from growth, which are great problems to have. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you learn a lot from all the mistakes you make in the early days. I want to stay on talent. Mm -hmm. And this is something that you mentioned to mm -hmm. me, that not just Spin Master, but other companies... Talent is one of the biggest problems because companies lose about 10 to 15 percent of their workforce every year. And when you have a company, probably about 1,500, 1,800 employees, it means you're losing 150 to 200 employees a year. You have to retrain them. Is there a way that businesses can overcome that or make it uh, easier to deal with? Yeah. So when it comes to talent, there, there, there's no... The, the, there's no brilliant idea. It's about the basics, right? Doing the basics really well is, you know, with respect to understanding what motivates each person, understanding how to career path, you know, knowing what's on people's mind, you know, creating the right environment, like we just created this global headquarters and the, and the environment we created for innovation. Um, and uh, making sure that you, you give people special projects and special assignments so that they are always learning. Mm -hmm. But the reality is this, is our competition, headhunters, people love calling Spin Master uh, and people love going after our talent. And we're, we're in a war on talent and we got to put truth on the table. Mm -hmm. And people love our talent because um, it's, it's known that if you work at Spin Master, you're more resilient, you got more grit, you're used to these crazy meetings and this, you know, this intellectual chaos and, and, you, and, you, and the whole balance between art and science. So, our, our people are more exposed to different areas of the business. Our people are more resilient. Our people are more, they have the courage to talk up and share their ideas because we actually, we reward people for, there's an amazing story about a lady who joined us um, from the Fisher Price office and she came up to Toronto and she, there she was, she stood up to Renan and Benny and, and us and she challenged all of us and the root, everyone couldn't believe, and she held her ground strategically. Mm -hmm. And from that, mon, from that moment, the respect for her was so high because the way she challenged us, for, it was so thoughtful, so strategic, she held her ground. And we want people to challenge us all the time because that's how we're going to make better decisions. Right. It's tiring, you know, when people challenge you, but at the, the goal is just to make great decisions. Now we have 29 offices, 2,000 employees, so it needs to be more systematic. It need, you know, we need to formalize how we're doing that. And that's what we're doing. We have this thing called Inspire in the organization where, um, where we're lifting our game in every angle of talent. So we're lifting our game in what does it take to be promoted, the manager capability. We're lifting our game in empowerment. We're lifting our game in um, even like things like well-being. Okay, and helping people with their, with their wellness. Mm -hmm. We're lifting our game with respect to pride in company and you know, the training, the development. We're gonna be building a Spin Master University. I mean, a lot of companies like Kraft or Procter & Gamble, Mattel, Hasbro, they have incredible training. Our training has always been on the job, like informal training, mm -hmm. when you have access to the, to the people at the top. But, but we, have to, we have to make that next step where we formalize training. We need to formalize stuff. I mean, we've always loved the informal culture in the organization, mm -hmm. but now the reality is with 29 offices, 2,000 employees around the world, we, we've got to start to, to uh, bring in that best in class, but do it, in a, do it in the touch of the spin master and in the entrepreneurial type of way. So you mentioned global headquarters. Can you talk a little bit more about that, what you're doing there? I, I didn't know about it personally. Did, did it did, no, I, I didn't. Yeah. For us, what's most important is talent. Mm -hmm. and, and we're a more diversified company than a lot of our competitors and, and you know, diversification is important to us. So it, it's, for us, it's all about you know, where is the greatest talent in the world 
in either different industries, in different areas, like for example, Toka Boca in Stockholm. Yeah. So, I mean, right now, when you look, when you think of Spinmaster from an innovation center, we have three, we have three core innovation hubs. We've got the West Coast in Culver City, mm -hmm. the innovation center there. We've got Toronto Innovation Center, and now we have Long Island City. And Long Island City has just come together, okay, in the last literally six months. In Long Island, we've got the whole games portfolio, mm -hmm. which is a very strategic, um, it's an important part of the company, reoccurring revenue, and it's uh, just been growing and growing and growing. Um, everything, you know, it's, uh, it, it's been a really healthy part of the company. But what's so exciting is the talent in the New York area, the fashion sensibility, Fashion and capital of the world. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And, and when you think of Spin Master, right, like think about plush. You want to lead the world in, in design and fashion sensibility. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in outdoor, right, I think we could be doing a better job in the design, mm -hmm. right, in, in the design of a lot of the, because design is just so important. Where we're living in a world where for the consumer, that emotional connection is more important than ever. Mm -hmm. My dream is that five years from now, Okay, we have, a, uh, we have a whole games ecosystem here with games designers, games developers, uh, influencers, and the marketers, and, and we have the best games, okay, um, just team and ecosystem um, in the world right here, right beside New York in Long Island City. And it's, I mean, I'm, I'm spending time interviewing people. I'm just going to an interview right after this, and um, the talent here is just phenomenal. You know, you got FIT here, and Judy Ellis has done a phenomenal job. So yeah, many of our so games designers has come out of there. The list goes on and on. Um, the fashion schools here, mm -hmm. you know, and we want to hire people that haven't, you know, that haven't come from the toy industry, just to get more diversity of thought. Toronto is the it, Toronto is the global headquarters, and we've created this brand new office, and our talent comes from everywhere. Like when you walk around, I just get, I get a I get goosebumps when I walk around the office. It's like the United Nations. And we just celebrate culture. And we've done things in the head office that, that we've just never done before. Because it was uh, like we created a history wall, right? And, and things that happened, like different innovation moments. The whole environment of the office has just been set up to foster creativity and innovation, you know, space for people to tinker and, um, you know, what one thing that was important is we learned so much from our failures. So on the sixth floor, right outside, in between, in between my office and the boardroom, okay, is a wall of failures. Because you learn more from your failures. And we want everyone to know that, you know, uh, we, we understand how to fail fast. When, when, when we launch a product, right, like Party Pop Teenies or something like that, and it doesn't work, we just move on quickly. So uh, failing, is, failing is important. And knowing how to fail fast is important too. And most importantly is learning from your failures so you don't repeat them. Let's talk about manufacturers within the toy business. And uh, you look at Mattel and you see how they've grown mm -hmm. by buying Fisher Price, by buying Tyco, by buying American Girl to reach a certain critical mass. Uh, same with Hasbro, Kenner, Parker, mm -hmm. Milton Bradley, mm -hmm. Wizards of the Coast. And it, it feels like in order to reach a certain critical mass, mm -hmm. you have to make, make acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Is that the case? Can you only grow so much? Uh, internally yeah. and you need before, to make before yeah. that's a great question you know firstly large ac large acquisitions um, are risky and over 60 percent of large acquisitions don't work out you know many different reasons culture um, sometimes a lot of the assumptions for growth were wrong um, so you first need to just start by humbling oneself and realizing that you know acquisitions they seem all sexy and everything like that and yeah you can get immediate growth but you have to humble yourself and realize that even the, the best in the world you know um, you know most acquisitions don't work out small acquisitions which has been a competitive advantage for us you, um, we have a higher we have a higher return on smaller acquisitions mm. so we have something that a lot of our competitors don't have to the same degree that which is? is we were we were we were started and founded on organic growth. And the way we innovate, the whole iterative process on the way we work with inventors and the whole innovation process, our internal act team and the way how Benny works, okay, with everyone. And there, there's so much, I could speak for hours about 
how we win, innovate, you can't just explain it in seconds, how we innovate, because so many different people, because what happens is an inventor will bring us a product, mm -hmm. like, like for example, Zoomer, it came to us uh, from Pete, and it was, it was a truck. And then Benny's like, well, why don't, we, why, uh, why don't we take the technology and make it a dog? And then he landed up working in our office for months. And it's just so much iterative process. Going back to your question is, is we don't have pressure on ourselves that we need to just go out and make a big acquisition for growth. Because firstly, we want to be patient. We want to make the right decisions. We're way more long-term focused than any of our competition. I mean, that's, that's a clear competitive advantage for Spinmaster because we're so young and we look at the world differently. So for us is we're not just trying to do a quick acquisition, right? Because we're concerned about anything in the short term. Mm -hmm. We want to do what's right for the company in the long term. And because we have grown up being scrappy, mm -hmm. knowing how to innovate, okay, from scratch, that um, the organic, okay, part of the, the organic part of the organization, okay, continue to, uh, will be able to allow us continue to fuel growth. The entertainment, we're investing more than we ever have. And on our seventh, in Toronto right now, we have an incredible, in, literally in 30 days, we're unveiling this incredible studio in Toronto, um, or in entertainment, the whole seventh floor of a building, 25,000 square feet. TV shows, movies, what, know, are you do, what are you doing in terms of entertainment? Are I mean, it's just, listen, it's, you know, when it comes, it's just producing great storytelling, okay. and there's so many different places that you can show it on, whether it's on YouTube or Nickelodeon, on all different places, so we're open. You know, it's, it's, it's all about creating an amazing story, just like Paw Patrol, right? Yeah, perfect. Um, so we're driving the entertainment and we're literally, we've invested, we've really increased our investment when it comes to um, all aspects of entertainment. Anton, one of the keys to Spin Master success is you have an unbelievable relationship with inventors. I've heard about wild weekends and all the inventors <laughs> come in, parties. Can you talk about- Creating an environment. Yes, right? creating an environment and the relationship with the inventor community. Well, yeah, there's, there's so much to share. And um, the mix of art and science and the way you, the way you, you walk that, t that fine rope is critical. And we've had art a little higher than science. We appreciate, we respect the importance of both, mm -hmm. and we utilize both every day. But when it comes to the innovation side of the business, art trumps science. It's been master. And, it, and it's a very important nuance, and the inventors love that. The second thing is, is relationships, is that the relationships whether it's the inventors or whether it's retailers or whether how we work with um, just any stakeholders in the world, whoever we're working with, if we're working with broadcasting companies, uh, we just did a, uh, we do partnerships with different games studios around the world, um, is we have such a genuine, authentic, deep, real way of establishing partnerships with people. So I can't say enough about how we develop these relationships and how we keep the relationships front and center. And our staff know. So people at Spin Master, whether, even if you're in the legal department, they know that if, you're, if they're working on a contract, okay, that they, they treat the partners differently because of the relationship. Mm. Right? And we want, after people sign contracts with us, we want them happier afterwards than they were before. Right. So there's so many layers at Spin Master because we have incredible engineers and designers in-house which are so in, uh, innovative. Like I could name people who are just so innovative in-house. Then we have these dedicated uh, innovation groups like the ACT group, the SMART group. Mm -hmm. These are all like acronyms for groups. Right. You know? so, so we've got you know, two of the founders who are great in innovation, not me. We've got yeah, dedicated innovation teams, then we've got inside the brand teams and the GBUs, there's great innovation. Then there's innovation that's coming. Like we get phone calls from, we get phone calls from companies like 3M type companies where they have like this crazy intellectual property and they're like, what's the application for kids? Because cool. you know, you guys are known as the best in the world dealing with inventors. Um, so we're, we're, we're getting innovation and, and intellectual property being brought to us from every corner of the world and it's, um, the, re the flywheel is happening with inventors because we're the first place inventors come to in the world when we treat them so well 
and we want them to do great. So it's just, it's something that's, it's just self-fulfilling. You talked about that facts are your friends. Yeah. You, you <laughs> talked about art and science. Mm -hmm. um, there are Antonisms, <laughs> and, and I want to discuss your favorite Antonisms before we go. I happen to have... I want to know them, too, okay, because I Jim to, mentioned this I to me I happen to have 12 office. Antonisms. Anton has preached his Antonisms. Matter of fact, my whole family knows them, <laughs> and my daughter saved them. So I have 12 Antonisms <laughs> right here, and things like facts of your friends and opinions, or if you don't ask, you don't get... As you mentioned, science so what, before. His, so uh, I it, know let's you got see. Feedback is a gift. Give, isn't feedback is a one. gift. Change or die. The only thing constant in life is change. And so I want you to know, my daughters have kept these. Mm -hmm. I've <laughs> kept these. What are your favorite Antonisms for business? You can even look. Well, triple your, O. Do you have triple O on there? I don't have triple O. Tell oh, me about tri you're triple O. Triple O is open mind, open heart, and open will, and it's about mindset. Okay. Okay. Right? And it's, oh, I, I didn't know. I have open mind, okay. open heart, open world. Yeah, that's triple. I have, I have, it. Oh, I have triple. So, yeah, and, that, and it, that goes back to you ask about how we work with inventors. Because mm -hmm. for us, we have an open mindset. Ideas can come from anywhere. Mm -hmm. It makes no difference where the ideas come from. I mean, we had a great arts and craft product that came from someone internally. Mm -hmm. you, know, on, um, you know, on something we're launching now. And it's just bunchums. There's a gentleman, Paul, internally, did a great job on it. So what's so important to us as an organization is having an open mindset. And that links to the way we treat partners. It, uh, it's the way we, uh, it's, there's no ego, and it's the way we have so many ideas flying on the table and the iterative process. And the open mindset is the foundation mm -hmm. to every, to every single aspect of the organization. And for me, you know, before I walk into any meeting, every moment, I'm always like, open my mind, don't, you know, and just, and just let things flow and ask questions and just get, because the, the people are so smart and just get all the ideas flying on the table and then we'll figure out how to sift through them. But there's, uh, <laughs> like, it, 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 you know, my, way, my he philosophy. Likes, he, he likes to ask questions because that's number 12. The person who's asking the questions is in control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, listen, it's, uh, a lot of those are part of my parenting technique. A lot of it is part of the company. Yeah. And it's a lot of it, it's just Flows who we throughout are. Your... Yeah, totally. Yeah. Anton, thank you for coming into Shop Talk. It's been long overdue. Yes. Yes. And if you want to see more episodes of Shop Talk, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and stay tuned.